Hi everyone, welcome to the Digital Fifth Fintech Show. Today we have with us Matthew, who is the CEO and the board member of Mahagri. Mahagri is one of the most innovative uh, MFI based out of Myanmar. And in today's session, we'll learn a lot about how Myanmar ecosystem works, how the economy is working right now in the COVID-19 situation, and how the MFI ecosystem is operating right now. So welcome on board, uh, Matthew. Uh, today we just want to know more about what Maha is all about and uh, what uh, what is happening in Myanmar. Over to you. Thank you, Samir, and uh, thank you for having me on the show. Um, well, Maha Agriculture Microfinance, uh, it's an MFI uh, that was founded in 2013 by Myanmar Oba Group, our majority shareholder, um, which happens to be also the largest uh, agricultural input group in the country, serving mm -hmm. over 3.5 million farming families. And uh, our minority shareholder is IFC, the International Finance Corporation uh, based out of Washington. Um, what's unique about MAHA is that we are an MFI, but we are an agri financial institution because 95% of our portfolio is exclusively dedicated to small older farmers uh, throughout Myanmar. Today, MAHA has uh, 32 branches spread over uh, eight big regions or divisions, as we call them here in Myanmar. Um, I manage a workforce of about 250 employees, and uh, we have uh, a portfolio outstanding of about $45 million, and we are serving 65,000 farmers throughout the country. The Uniqueness also about our institution is that uh, agriculture accounts for about 29% of Myanmar's GDP. Mm -hmm. uh, and it employs, agriculture employs up to 70% of the total workforce of the country. Mm -hmm. uh, and because of our parent uh, uh, company, parent group uh, that has been uh, dealing with farmers uh, for the last 25 years, our DNA uh, is rural, and we take quite a big pride in saying that we know what farmers want and uh, and what their pain points are. Over to you, Samir. Okay, okay, this is interesting. And uh, so, in terms of uh, the ecosystem, uh, can you just share a bit more about Myanmar's uh, MFI ecosystem and sure. overall how Myanmar is operating right now? Perfect. Um, so first of all, the, the country is quite vast. Uh, it's about uh, 55 million in population with uh, uh, several big uh, regions and states uh, neighboring India, Bangladesh, and uh, China and Thailand. Uh, Myanmar obviously is in a very important strategic uh, geopolitical location between uh, two uh, global players such as India and China. Uh, the financial inclusion uh, ecosystem in Myanmar is uh, built uh, under two different uh, um, regulators. There is on one side the central bank of Myanmar supervising uh, commercial banks, be it uh, foreign banks or local banks, state-owned banks. The central bank of Myanmar also supervises uh, mobile money operators mm -hmm. and finance companies or NBFCs. Okay. On the other side, we have uh, the Ministry of Planning and Finance, under which there is a body called FRD, Financial Regulatory Department, that is considered to be the microfinance regulator. Mm -hmm. The microfinance uh, uh, industry is composed right now of 193 MFIs licensed by the FRD under the Ministry of Planning and Finance. The microfinance sector, in a way, was officially born in 2011 when the first microfinance business law was enacted by the parliament and when this body FRD was put together. Um, this is quite interesting because you would imagine that uh, uh, the central bank of Myanmar, like in India, the RBI, would be the regulator of the sector. In Myanmar, it's quite different. We are under the Ministry of Planning and Finance uh, and Industry, uh, as, it, as, it, as it is called now. And uh, we've been uh, under this ministry, under the FRD, since 2011. Obviously, we could talk about it a bit later. This creates uh, opportunities, but a lot more challenges, because uh, especially when crisis hit uh, it's very important for the microfinance sector to be under a super partis uh, technical regulator rather than 
uh, a regulator that could be influenced by politicians and by uh, and by and by their constituencies. Obviously, we have seen, uh, especially in the last few weeks since the beginning of the crisis here in Myanmar, how it was not very easy for our regulator to be between us practitioners and some of those chief ministers locking down their regions. But I'm sure you'll ask me the question later on, and I'm sure we'll talk about it during uh, today's conversation with you, Samir. Okay. 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 So what has been the impact right now of COVID-19 on Myanmar itself uh, from overall perspective? And how is the customer behavior changing? What kind of opportunities will lie? Just like that. Thank you, Samir. Well, as of uh, yesterday, 1st of May, I have noted down some numbers. Allow me to read them. Um, allow, allow me to read them. We have 151 uh, positive cases, of okay. which 118 are in Yangon, where I'm currently based. We have 28 recovered cases, and we have six deaths. Uh, we also have 3,000 uh, cases under investigation. We have 42, over 42,000 people at uh, uh, facilities in quarantine. Uh, we have 134 hospitalized patients. Uh, 8,000 specimens have been tested already. And uh, right now, Samir, I have to say, I've been living in this country, uh, which is for me now home, Myanmar, for the last uh, almost eight years. Um, at, the, at the end of March, when uh, the tensions were rising in the country because of the fear of the COVID-19 and its spread, a lot of foreigners uh, uh, were evacuated away from Myanmar back to their home countries. And the reason is that uh, all the diplomats and the embassies were very concerned about the well-being of, of course, of the expat community and the local community, uh, especially because there are very few ventilators in the country. Mm -hmm. There are only 250 ventilators as of now. 300 have been ordered and 50 have already arrived. Nobody knows exactly how many beds in intensive care units there are, but very few. And now the government is obviously trying hard to reconvert uh, uh, all facilities into COVID hospitals with the help of the army um, in, in, in the country and a lot of other volunteer associations. The situation right now, Samir, it's not of a health crisis in Myanmar. The government is handling very well, in my humble opinion, the crisis. The Ministry of Health has uh, given, uh, has, has issued a lot of directives telling us what to do, what not to do. The country is in a lockdown phase, similar to India, until the 15th of May. But slowly, uh, some factories are being inspected as we speak, and some factories will reopen very soon. The, when all these diplomats uh, have told us uh, foreign workers uh, to evacuate, obviously the angle where, where that came from was simply that the country has very poor health infrastructures. Mm -hmm. And should the country face uh, COVID-19 numbers similar to, to the ones we're seeing in Europe or UK or US, obviously we would be in a very difficult position here given that that would create massive stress on already poor healthcare facilities. I personally, with my wife uh, we've been, uh, and my team, we've been working from home since March 19. My entire team uh, has been divided into two groups, the head office that is comprised of about 50 people has been working from home since March 19, and they will be working from home for sure until May 30. Uh, my branch teams have been split into two groups, one group working in the branches and the other group uh, being at home, and we are rotating them every 28 days in order to avoid any possible spread of the virus or infection, so that if one group gets sick, at least they can be quarantined in a hospital or back home. Oh, okay, okay, okay. So this is, uh, I mean, almost the way a war is fought, right? You have plan A and plan B and group A and group B. I think that's what we have seen uh, even now in India. Most of the companies are opening exactly like in that fashion. Otherwise, you run the risk of bringing the whole business uh, down. So coming back to uh, the overall crisis handling, how did, I mean, maybe we need to know more about how uh, Maha operates and how the impact is less because you are, I have seen, I've heard about more about you getting in more digital sites. How did, does that help you in staying alive in this current situation? 
Sure, Samir, thank you. Well, first of all, we are 100% rural agri-FI. We are also 100% uh, individual lending, MFI. Uh, we don't do any group loans. Uh, we offer cash crop loans to farmers to cover their input agri cost at the beginning usually of uh, their agri seasons. There are typically two main agri seasons in Myanmar. Our loans in duration are on average of six months and we are crop agnostic as we, as we typically like to say. We serve over 30 different uh, short-term crops across the country. Obviously paddy uh, being a very important crop for us but then followed by green gram, black gram, onions, cauliflower, uh, watermelon, corn, uh, sesame, pulses, you name it. Uh, for us, this is very important because it also uh, works as a very strong uh, risk mitigating uh, strategy. Having uh, different crops in the portfolio avoids us having concentration risk towards uh, one crop or the other. Um, having said that, uh, what's unique about Maha is that we act and think like a fintech, or at least uh, we try to act and think like a fintech. We want to learn fast, we want to fail fast, we want to adapt fast to, to, to the market uh, changing conditions, also to our internal systems and processes. And uh, you and I have met uh, uh, some years ago when Maha was uh, busy moving away from a traditional lending model to a more uh, digital uh, data-driven lending model. We are still not completely there, but I'm glad to report to you that today Maha is able to uh, have a turnaround time of about 48 hours from the moment someone approaches us for a loan request till the moment we disburse. Uh, now we are able to see a 48 hours EAT, uh, which has been an incredible journey for us. Uh, and just to put things into perspective, a year and a half ago, it would take us almost 15 days, two weeks to disburse a loan. Now we're back to 48 hours. And I think this, it's in a way something that in my humble opinion, it's very similar to a lot of your FinTech uh, customers and clients in India and in other countries. Um, because unfortunately, Maha still uses cash for its disbursements and repayments. This crisis obviously has affected our ability to collect money. Uh, especially because of those uh, regional lockdowns that have been imposed in almost half of the country from April 1st to April 30th. And some of those lockdowns are now being extended to mid-May. Um, farmers were unable to pay back their loans. And Maha had quite a bit of a concentration amount of portfolio coming due for ma to maturity uh, between April, May and June. Uh, 2020, about 60% of our portfolio is coming to maturity. And that's why uh, for us, it was critical to continue our operations and continue collecting as much as possible. That was not made possible by those lockdowns. We had to close uh, some branches for a few weeks. We had to uh, reschedule loans. We had to also uh, make sure that farmers were aware that if they wanted, they could pay us in the locations that they were open. We had to unfortunately deal with a lot of uncertainties and the difficulties because farmers were willing to repay, but they were not, for example, allowed to leave their village or they were not allowed to come to our branches. Uh, our team was also not allowed to go to collect uh, uh, at, at the location of the farmers. And I think this, Samir, it is, it's, obvious, it's, a, it's an obvious realization that Maha, uh, after the crisis, uh, uh, we need absolutely, we need to push uh, forward uh, towards a more digital cashless way of handling these uh, repayments and disbursement. We knew that even before the crisis, but probably this COVID-19 situation is accelerating the need for Maha to go towards that direction, a direction where there is no cash, a, a, a direction where farmers are able to uh, obtain uh, repayments and disbursements via a smartphone, via an app, uh, via in partnership with mobile money companies. The only issue here, Samir, which I'm sure I think some of our um, colleagues in India find this as a similarity to your country, cash is still very much the king in rural areas of Burma, of Myanmar. Uh, the ecosystem around the farmers in rural areas of Burma is still very much uh, based on cash. So while Maha and I'm sure other financial institutions have the ambition to move away from cash, 
and this is important because with cash uh, you have extra cost you have certain risks at the same time uh, we need to be asking ourselves the question are we being really customer centric if we eliminate cash from us and the farmer but the ecosystem still requires cash meaning that if i would give a loan to a farmer and put e money in his phone if that e money cannot be spent on products or services and the farmer still needs to then exchange from e money back to cash are we helping the farmer or are we just uh, massaging our ego no i like, agree i think uh, digital to each uh, sort of ecosystem is different and maybe uh, Myanmar is different because they don't, I mean, right now we don't have a country level payment infrastructure itself, right? So if people don't have, I mean, we think of ATMs as closed by things, but reality is not there. So if you give them uh, maybe e-money, I totally agree. I think they may not have any usage for it. Thanks, uh, Matthew, for insights. Uh, would you want to share a last one or two points before we close? Sure. Um, for example, the what's i find uh, that there is a silver lining for myanmar which is the resilience of its uh, rural people the population i mean myanmar is a fascinating country that i've started to appreciate uh, since many years ago uh, people have been under a military dictatorship for about 50 years uh, uh, from a political angle the country has gone through the first free and fair democratic elections in 2015 um, there is so much more that we could do in partnership with FinTech and AgTech in rural Myanmar. And I would very much welcome the opportunity to partner also with Indian FinTech companies to see whether we can solve the pain points of uh, smallholder farmers in rural Burma. I think uh, this crisis is ob ob obviously also making us ask uh, some fundamental questions such as what's going to be the new normal? What does it mean going back to business as usual? Uh, are we, are we going to see a, a, a dramatic shift from a high-touch model to a low-touch model? Well, I would welcome the opportunity of shifting a bit away from a high-touch, low-touch. Don't get me wrong. I, as a CEO of Maha, that's clear that it's part of the journey that we need to walk. But at the same time, at the same time, Moving away from a high touch to low touch should not be at the expense of uh, deteriorating the relationship between our loan officers and our farmers. Having a low touch model does not mean that we should forget about what the client's protection principles are. Having a low touch model does not mean that we forget about the impact, that we forget about the social performance uh, uh, side of our business. I think this is an important element for me, uh, for Manha. We are a triple bottom line company. We take a, a close, serious look at the environment, social and governance. And for us, uh, we have uh, done quite a bit of work in terms of client service, uh, client satisfaction service, client exit service. Uh, we are now working with Smart Campaign in order to get our own uh, certification, hopefully within this year. Uh, I th I th all of this should definitely be part of the same digital cashless uh, uh, 2.0 business model that Maha wants to build in the months to come, Samir. Fantastic, fantastic. And after I think this session, maybe we next time when we we'll meet, we'll, we should be able to meet physically uh, in, in uh, Yangon. I, absolutely, Samir. We look forward to seeing you. I look forward to coming back to India and uh, we, we, we really look forward to also welcoming you back to Myanmar as soon as those uh, travel restrictions are lifted. Thank, Thank you so much for having me and uh, really congratulations to yourself and your colleagues at Digital Fifth because uh, we are a big fan of what you guys are doing and we're more than happy to collaborate and keep our friendship uh, uh, as our North Star. Thank you, Samir, Thank and uh, take care. Bye-bye.